Grace, mercy, and peace are yours, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. From God, our Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, our serving Lord. Amen. Well, I've had nose problems for pretty much my whole life. As far back as I can remember, I've had allergies, which I'm sure many of you can relate to. Uh, I, had, I developed asthma at a very young age, so that any time I had any sort of uh, extraneous activity, I'd have trouble getting enough oxygen through my nose, and you have to breathe heavy and slump over and do all these sorts of things. And then you add on top of that sinusitis, sinus infections, nasal swelling, sinus swelling, the, the list goes on and on, and breathing a normal part of life suddenly becomes a burden. Well, when I was about 30, I finally decided to do something about this, and I had a doctor look at it and and say I had a deviated septum. So if you're not familiar with it, the middle part of your nose called the septum, and normally it's supposed to go straight up the middle so that your two nostrils are evenly sized, right? And air can go evenly through them. But if it veers to one side or the other, it's called a deviated septum. And then it makes breathing more difficult. And so the doctor can go in and fix that. And that's what I had done. And it made things a lot better. Now, it didn't do anything for allergies or or the sinuses or anything like that, but it did make breathing a lot better. Well, the sainted Dr. Norman Nagel, a former professor at Concordia Seminary, St. Louis, wrote an article about the Office of the Holy Ministry, the pastoral office, and he wrote about its relation to the rest of the church, all all of you, those who are not in the clergy, so pastor and the church, and he likened it to two nostrils of a nose, so the the church and the ministry, the, the, the people and the pastors, They're like two nostrils of one nose, okay? And he gave some examples of time in history where uh, the church favored one side or the other. And so as like a deviated septum, you might imagine that this can cause some problems. And we see this in the church today. Even congregations within our own synod, there are some strong leanings to prefer the church over the ministry. Uh, what that looks like is we say that pastors are, are sort of like a life coach. They stand up here and, and we give you some, some life advice. We might tell you some fun stories, give you some witticisms, that sort of thing. But we don't really do anything that's different from anyone else. But that's not the truth. But it's not surprising that we would have that opinion because we find ourselves in a supremely egalitarian society. It's a society that tells us that any hint of hierarchy, of structure, is bad. It it denigrates it with terms like hierarchy or, or authoritarian or even unequal. It tries to tell us that we're all interchangeable widgets, that we're all the same. It, you know, just take this person, put them over here, just switch them around. We're all the same. And that any sort of deviation from a flattened arrangement is hateful and oppressive. But that's not how Scripture speaks. No, Scripture doesn't speak in these egalitarian terms. Our epistle reading. From Paul, writing to the Ephesians. Uh, This is a great example. Paul writes to the Ephesians that Jesus gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Now, I want to pull out that, that body of Christ image for a moment because Paul uses that in several of his, in his epistles, several of his letters to the churches. And Paul is absolutely clear that we are not interchangeable widgets. 
We're not all eyes or ears. We're not all feet or hands. No, we all have different roles to play. And each role is important. No role is more important than the other, but they are different. And that difference is structured in a particular way. And so to deny that structure is to deny God's own design. And so Paul expresses here in this text that pastors are God's gift to the church. He gave them to the church, and he gave them to perform a specific function within the church. In this text, it expresses that function as teaching and equipping. But it's also described in other ways, in different places. So in our own Lutheran confessions, we have various documents that spell out what we believe, how we understand the scriptures, how, what we confess to be the Christian faith. And one of the, the first documents in there is called the Augsburg Confession. And it lays out the articles of faith and doctrine. It starts off, it's, it's telling the story of everything, of God and his creation. And so, of course, it starts out with Article 1. It talks about God. Who is God? How he's created everything. And then Article 2 moves on to say there is a reality of the fall, of original sin, that man broke God's creation. It's cursed. And then it moves on to the solution, which is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Article 3. And then Article 4 is, how is this worked out? How does that come to us? It's called justification by faith, how we are made right with God through faith in Christ. And this is great. This is a great trajectory, telling the story of everything, what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a creature in God's creation. And if you're looking at that trajectory, you might think, that the church is next. What is Article 5? It might be the church because, well, you know, God sent Jesus and, and we're justified by faith in him and, well, we're here in the church. This is where we receive faith and where we live our faith out and hear about faith and this sort of thing. But it's not. You would be mistaken if you thought Article 5 was the church. No, indeed, uh, the writers of the Augsburg Confession make Article 5 the pastoral office, the preaching office, what Pastor Braun and I are living out. Melanchthon writes that to obtain such faith, the faith in Christ which justifies us, which sets us right with God, God instituted the office of preaching, giving the gospel and the sacraments. It's through these, as through means that he gives the Holy Spirit, who produces faith where and when he wills in those who hear the gospel, the good news of Jesus. It teaches that we have a gracious God, not through our merit, but through Christ's merit when we so believe. Perhaps that worked. Maybe my battery died. Okay. So God works through means, just as he works through technology. We recognize this in various ways. God works through means. And the pastoral office is that chosen means. It's this chosen means for delivering the goods, giving you the word and the sacraments through which the Holy Spirit works, faith, and then ultimately salvation, new life, eternal life in you. But he does the same thing in people around you and in the whole church. This is how God has chosen to operate. And so recognizing that, it's understandable that Luther would see this and make the pastoral office one of the marks of the church. This is the the series we've been going through is Luther's marks of the church. And so after recognizing the centrality of the word and sacraments, what the church, what makes us the church, how we're fed and how we confess and 
that the, the office of the keys that we discussed last week, how we forgive each other or we withhold forgiveness from someone who does not repent. And we mentioned that pastors do this publicly, so it's only natural that Luther would see God has called someone to handle these marks, to handle the word and the sacraments so that we would have certainty. So Luther writes regarding this mark that the church is recognized externally by the fact that it consecrates or calls ministers or has offices that it is to administer. So this administering of the word and sacraments, that's it's manifested itself here in this preaching, what I'm doing right now, but throughout the service, the confession and absolution that we had earlier, through our, 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 our singing, through the various parts of the divine service, it's manifested in baptizing children or adults, in teaching, in Bible study, in the Lord's Supper, which we're about to receive. And of course, all of this comes together. It's all driving at one thing, driving at giving you faith in Jesus, through which you are reconciled to God. You are made right, and you are given the sure promise of eternal life in the end. And so God calls men into this office to administer these, these gifts, but more specifically, to give you certainty to have a flesh and blood man stand here, hear your confession, and speak words into your ears that say, I forgive you. In the stead and by the command of Jesus Christ, the Lord of all creation, I forgive you. And I know that sounds a lot like last week's sermon, if you were here, but that's the point, is that God is so abundant in his mercy and in his grace that he gives it to us in so many different forms, and that the pastoral office is bound up so much together with that office of the keys to give you the sure, certain hope of God's forgiveness and life, something that a feeling in your heart when you're reading scripture just can't give you. But of course, this is only one side of the nostril, or one nostril of the nose, right? The one side of the coin. And we don't want to emphasize one side over the other. There, there, there are those churches that we said earlier that emphasize the church over the ministry. And we don't want to do that, but it's just as bad to lean the other way because the deviated septum works either way. So there, there are churches that will emphasize pastors over the church. And they'll say that, you know, you're here and you're not really doing much of anything. You know, you just come here, let us do all the work, and then you go out and do whatever. But that's not what God calls us to. That's, that's not how Scripture speaks. That's not reality. Instead, what we see is not only is the pastoral office a gift to the church, but the church is God's gift to the pastoral office, okay? So, yes, you pay our salaries. We recognize that. We're thankful for that. But that's not just it, right? You are called here, and you give us purpose in many ways, right? The, the, the church and the office are two nostrils of one nose. You can't separate them. They're always together. They're always together. And so just as I was called into this office by God to be pastor, you were called here as Christian into this church by God. It's all his doing. We confess this along with Luther in the explanation to the third article of the Creed. This probably sounds familiar. We say, I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him, but the Holy Spirit 
has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. In the same way he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. So yes, at the same time, God works through means, and so he has used you to call me. He has placed me here, but he's also used you as a means to call me here. And then he uses me as a means to proclaim faith to you. So we bless each other, and this is God's doing. It's God's church. He provides for it. He builds it up, and he preserves it. It's all God's grace. This is how it works. But, dear friends, this is not a time to sit back and lounge. Yes, we are here by grace. It's not our doing. We have not earned our place here. Nothing we have done can make us deserve our place as a child of God, our forgiveness. But we're called to be servants. Our gospel reading from John 13 spells this out quite well. Jesus said, you call me master, and, or you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought also to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So having been called forth by the gospel, enlightened by his gifts, sanctified and uh, forgiven, brought into the light and life and forgiveness of God, we were called forth to serve, to serve our Lord who has redeemed you, who has rescued you, who has ransomed you, and to serve your neighbor. And so this applies just as much to pastors as it does to the lady, you who are not pastors, right? The whole church. Jesus said to his disciples, meaning all his disciples, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as ransom for many. And this is not new, dear friends. Yes, Jesus has served us and we are called to be servants just as he served us. But this is not new. This has been God's design from the very beginning. We're looking at Exodus in the Bible study, and we didn't quite get there today, so come next week. I'm sure we'll get there then. But in Exodus 4, God tells Moses to tell Pharaoh, Israel is my firstborn son. Let him go that he may serve me. It's a call to service, to serve the Lord. And this is before Exodus too. This is from the very beginning in the Garden of Eden. God created Adam and Eve, put man and woman into the garden and said, be fruitful and multiply. Take care of the earth. We've been created as stewards, caregivers, servants from the very beginning. And so, pastors, we're servants. We're servants serving you who are servants. This is the design. This is what God has been doing. This is what God does in his church. We've been given authority by Christ to perform specific functions in the church, but we're never given to abuse that authority, to lord it over you, the church. And so this is me telling you that as part of your service, you watch us. Yes, we set examples for you to how to, on how to live, but you have the authority to tell us if we've done wrong. You call us out. We're not above 
you telling us if we've done something wrong. Just as we tell you if you've done something wrong and we call you to repent, you call us to repent. We serve each other. This is how the church works. And so, we're here. We're working together. We serve you. You serve the world. You serve each other. And so, as Christians, service is sort of like breathing for us. We just do it oftentimes without even thinking about it. And when you have an issue with breathing, it can get in the way. So having a balanced nose, having a balanced nose, having those two nostrils working together, breathing together, that service comes much more naturally, much better. It works better. So may the Lord of the church give us his spirit of service so that we would show forth to the world that we have the spirit of service, that we are Christians, and that this is the church, his church, the body of Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.